Hi, this is Benjamin from the UK true crime podcast, They Walk Among Us. Brought to you by AMC Networks, Shudder is a premium streaming experience that provides a multi-sensory dive into fantastical worlds, offering the very best of old and new horror. Discover films and series that covers the entire horror spectrum, including highly anticipated new releases like The Boy Behind the Door and Psycho Gorman to giants of the horror genre like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween. What's more, you can watch one of my all-time favourite films, Mandy, a spiralling, surreal, bloody journey of revenge with visuals that are simply mind-blowing. Exceptional originals, movies, TV series and live events, there's always something new and unexpected for Shudder members to experience. Sign up at Shudder.com. Hi, I'm Aurelia, a Romanian living in Canterbury, and you're listening to Dan Baptiste Questions Everything. My question is, what life skill would be extremely useful but is rarely thought? Okay, here comes the show, and remember, question everything. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dame Baptiste Questions Everything, a podcast for myself, comedian, writer, and occasional actor Dame Baptiste, my producer friend Howard Cohen, aka The Hizzer. Hello. And a mix of very special guests pose the questions that need to be asked. And we are talking everything from. Well, we are talking everything from Aurelia from Canterbury's question What life skill would be extremely useful but is rarely found? Dane, what. Well, I, I, tough ones that's a it's a tough one that's a really good question Aurelia thank you so much um that means gold by the way Howard did you know that nice good little tidbit there very good the 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 etymology of AU on the periodic table anyway I digress Mm. um golden question what life skill would be extremely useful but is rarely found um a photographic memory that's a great you know what you've won there that's a very good one (laughs) that's a very good one when you meet someone who's got it it's kind yeah. of almost like a curse, isn't it? But it does sound like quite a useful skill, potentially. Yeah, I think I think it's a blessing and a curse. I think it's very, very useful. I think if you are involved in any games of memory, mm. um, or even games of chance, if you're able to count cards and stuff. Or just to-do lists. Things. Just to-do to-do lists. lists, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. You know, if you are working in law enforcement and you're a detective, also very helpful. But by, I think by the same token, you know, if you are... As a child, having an authoritarian tell you to do something or talk about something and be able to accurately, almost photographically recall what took place Mm. can be very frustrating for adults. So, Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, It's a golden question. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, suffice to say, on this podcast, we ask and answer all the questions, don't we, Dave? Absolutely. No question is too big, small. Highbrow, lowbrow, or taboo. So therefore, if you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or follow us on Spotify and you'll never miss an episode. Or subscribe to us on Acast, the world's biggest podcast network where you can hear all of our questions being answered by all of our very special guests. With that being said, on today's show, our guest is a British politician. He is Shadow Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and has been MP for Doncaster North since 2005. He was previously leader of the Labour Party between 2010 and 2015. He served in the cabinet from 2007 to 2010 under Prime Minister Gordon Brown. He also has a very nice podcast entitled Reasons to be Cheerful. And later on this year, he will release a book about the idealistic way we can improve the world country by country called Go Big. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Ed Miliband. Hello. Very good to be with you. Thank you for coming on the show. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. In fact, my book is already just to get in the pl- the shot on the plug early. It's it already out. Love it. Uh, it's already out, guys. There you go. So, 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 so there you go. Way out. But gr- but great to be here. Yeah. And um um, did you? What did you think of our question from our listener? Uh, life skills that are rarely found but are useful. So I was thinking about it. Here's the one I would name, which is the ability to have very little sleep and still to be able to function. <laughs> That's a father speaking. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> because I need, I need my sleep. But there are some politicians like Mrs. Thatcher, apparently, who only had sort of required four or five hours sleep a night. And I must mm. say, I, I kind of, I, I, I'd find that quite difficult. But you know, if you could get, create more time in the day, I always think it would be quite a good thing to be able to, and, and still be 
still behave in a sort of reasonably irrational way. I think that would yeah. be quite a good skill to have. I've got that skill, just so you know, Dane. I've never told you. I've never told you this, Dane, but I've got that skill. If you gave me like three hours sleep, I'll be fine. I can probably do like three days like that and then I'll collapse. Is that right? I'll collapse, yeah. I'll absolutely break. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think most people would then, Howard, as well, because that's pretty good. But three hours. So are you able, and this is a question to both of you, mm. not, not the question, but are you both able to go to, go to sleep as soon as you like lay down? Yeah, I struggle with that. Yeah, it's just the quiet, the quieting of the brain and uh, trying to relax and stuff. Because obviously, you do most of your reflection before you go to sleep. So I feel like my brain is almost more active sometimes than when during the day than when I'm before I go to sleep. So I find it very hard. Whereas the Margaret Thatcher thing doesn't really surprise me. The thing that I find difficult is sort of it's it's waking up in the it's, it's when you wake up in the middle of the night, you go to sleep for a few hours, and then something wakes you up, and then you're sort of yeah. you know that that's the thing that sort of um, uh, slightly gets me, but um, yeah, yeah, that ability to the ability to switch off. I think maybe working. My my wife Justine always says to me, you know, the later you work into the evening, the harder it is to switch off. That's yeah. why comedians can't sleep. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Yeah, I'm, my my uh, hours are way off. I know there's so many like people that advertise very uh, organized and efficient routines about wake up at five. Like you know, Mark Wahlberg had that workout when he was like, mm. wake up at four, go for a jog exercise then have a protein meal and he's like done two days of gym work by 7 a.m whereas i go to bed i think i'm, I'm in bed only for a couple of hours when mark Wahlberg was waking up because comedians <laughs> are night hours i'm a nocturnal species so yeah i can we, we kind of do like shift work i lay down and take care of dreamland <laughs> as a superhero and mark Wahlberg wakes up yeah. but you, you, yeah, you are intertwined are, are, in some kind nocturnal of species yeah but, yeah um, it is probably time for a question, Dane, as the format of this show dictates, mate. Absolutely, Mr. Ed Miliband. As our very esteemed guest, we'd like to welcome you uh, the uh, platform to ask the first question, which we'd like to discuss with you for 15 minutes or so. Then Howard will do the same. We'd like to ask a question towards yourself, which we'd like to discuss for 15 minutes, and then lather rinse, repeat. I'd like to direct a final question towards yourself. And then we would like for you to tell our listeners, if they don't know where they can already, find out more about your good works. And uh, yeah, more about uh, the good work you're doing. How does that sound? Sounds great. Shall I, shall I go? Absolutely. So my question to both of you is, what gives you hope? Oh, interesting. Mm. Can I ask what inspired this question, please, Ed? Well, look, it's partly what my book is trying to do, because because I, as you will probably know, uh, I was sleeping as a late party, Dane said in his introduction, uh, in 2015, and then I lost the general election and resigned. Um, and I felt pretty hopeless at that point. Um, uh, and I then started this podcast with Jeff Lloyd, um, radio presenter, which was trying to look at ideas from around the world because the, the, the whole idea of the podcast, the idea of the book is there are great ideas around the world to solve any problem we have in this country if we only sort of lift our eyes and look, and look out for them. So whether it's affordable housing, climate change, the inequality we face, um, how we tackle sort of the wealth gaps that, that we have as a country, how we have better care for mm. young people, older people, how we improve our democracy. All of those things are solvable problems. And, and so I suppose what gives me hope is partly thinking there are great ideas out there uh, to solve the problems, to, to, to answer those problems. It's not like these problems are insoluble. And secondly, which also the book does, is the people who are, who are making change happen, both in this country and um, and elsewhere? Mm. So when I lo- when I lost the general election, um, I it's just uh, want to let our listeners know that you laugh as you say that, just because not, everyone, yeah, exactly. not everyone would be able to laugh about that. No, no, I think it's, it's sort of maybe it's a bit of a false laugh. So, <laughs> so when I lost the general election, I um, I went on this course that autumn. Um, it's called, it was, it's called community organising, which is basically how do you organise at the grassroots? And it's a whole method, right? And the story that sticks with me, and you have to bear with me here a bit, is, was, and I interviewed them for my podcast recently, there were some Somali young people in Cardiff, right, um, who felt really sort of alienated by a whole set of things. And the thing they most, but, but, and, and this organisation, Citizens UK, um, got in touch with them, got met them and said, well, what do you really want to change? And they said, well, I think that it's possibly possible to change. And they said, there are three Nandos in Cardiff and none of them are halal. <laughs> and they said, we want one of them to become halal, right? 
And so they did this campaign, including with the Nando suits, including threatening for the Bishop of Cardiff to dress up in a chicken suit. And they got their halal Nando's. And now they are like community campaigners campaigning for the living wage and other things. Now, why do I tell that story? Because I think I think people's ability to change things is something we underestimate. Actually, pe- good people getting together can change things. So that's mm. what gives me hope. And, and Dane, you've said that many times about you know activism. We talk about activism on this show quite a lot, Ed. I mean, I, I don't know what your answer is, Dane. I definitely know what mine is, mate. I've, I've, I've got. I mean, that, that, that's an example of a lot of great hope. Is that you know, it's um, despite sometimes the, out the uh, overt narrative you hear from mainstream media is this idea that there are schisms all over the country, but to see you know guys, young men who were um, Somalian immigrants who very clearly are happy to integrate with into British society, just based on one small stipulation which I guess a halal nando would be the equivalent of having a pub. And so that gives me a lot of hope, um, as does, I'd say, I attended the uh, Black Lives Matter protests last year, and I was one of the oldest people there. And that gave me a lot of hope that there is a whole successive generation of politically active wow. and, yeah, and very uh, and politically astute young people who are aware of, um, you know, Racial issues of race relations in this country um, are working to address and try to alleviate those racial tensions. And um, for me, it's very refreshing to feel like, you know, I don't have to necessarily worry about if young people are as politically engaged um, as previous generations have been because they are completely as, if not more so. That was literally going to be my... <laughs> oh, I what? thought he was going to do football. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't do football. I'm an Arsenal fan. Uh, I was literally going to say the same thing, which is, which is young people. There's a some, something, of, and, and, and this is a complicated one in many respects, because there are things that I think are distracting young people from some issues that maybe... Uh, you know, kind of a, 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 a should be more focused on. I think that there's e- they, they can be easily distracted in this era, but the, the the way the young people are now compared to what they were like when me and Dane were there, like we didn't, I don't think we engaged at all. Right. Dane, I, I personally, like it, it didn't feel that way because, because life under Blair, if we kind of yeah. compare that era, like, you know, it was, it was quite it was, promising. It was, well, well, yeah. When economic prosperity does p- give people the privilege of not really having to uh, scrutinise uh, political politics as much as they have to do now. Um, so, yeah, uh, in some way, you know, and that was, a, that was a slogan that things could only get better. But I think, I know, and I definitely had a lot of optimism around that time. I think, you know, the availability of uh, higher education and stuff, uh, you know, more affordable housing at the time uh, was... Uh, created a whole zeitgeist of hope at the time. I'd say, obviously, economic times have changed. But I would say that's another thing that gives me hope is watching how people have learned to thrive and to uh, endure tougher economic times. And if nothing else, it's just made people pay a lot more attention to how their country and how their bipartisan political system works. And But also kind of some freedoms, right, Dane? So, you know, kind of take, for example, you know, uh, LGBT issues that, you know, when we were growing up, uh, were far more kind of I don't know. It was just a diminished. We just didn't offer uh, the, was, the same. I mean, very superficial at best. Is yeah, there you go. You would see, yeah, it would, it would be it would be like having a very uh, maybe a palatable aesthetic for more marginalised groups would appear maybe in TV, mainstream media, and it'd be quite kitsch or caricatured, and that would be fine. But I think that does the democratisation of social media. Um, and seeing a new landscape for democratic voices to kind of play out um, is very difficult, obviously, because you get a lot of negative narratives on social media. But at the same time, it has provided an enormous landscape for a global um, method of communication for younger people and for people in general. Um, It provides opportunities and access to information that may not be um, so privy to people if they just subsisted on mainstream media. Well, it's like an evolution, isn't it? It's like an evolution of of, of thought that these young people are kind of growing up with so that kind of some things that we were growing up with are kind of, like I say, diminished. Uh, I don't know if you kind of feel that. You mentioned uh, your family or young people, uh, Ed, you know. uh, I don't know if you feel that you're seeing the same thing that me and Dane are seeing. Definitely. And... um... And I'm really struck by what you say about LGBT rights, because look, when I was growing up, it was the time of Section 28, which was supposedly outlawing teaching of teaching in inverted commas of homosexuality in schools. I mean, it was a terrible time. And, you know, the transformation 
has been uh, extraordinary. And and that isn't to say there aren't still battles to be won. But here's the thing, which I also say in the book, and which I do strongly feel it's a strange thing for a politician to say, it didn't happen because politicians made it happen. I mean, politicians did do the legal changes, hmm. but actually it was lesbian and gay people who said, we're not putting up with this. And and it's this thing of struggle. And you know, <laughs> that's what political change is. It is about struggle and it is about hard struggle and it is about defeat as well as victory. I mean, maybe I'm a good person to say that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I think that is sort of, I think that's really, really important. That, that it is it, it's it's really hard you know mm. it isn't easy and it is sometimes sort of the the progress is glacial and that you sometimes think is it really making a difference and then yet things move and and if you can get enough people together for a movement you can you can get change and uh, by the way the other thing that gives me hope is being a public figure is a slightly peculiar existence um, because you know people recognize you on the street and so on, and maybe it happens a bit less than it did, but it still happens. Um, people are basically very nice. I know that sounds ridiculous, <laughs> maybe, but I mean people are basically decent. Yeah. You know, you get an image of the country sometimes from the newspapers and elsewhere, which is and from Twitter, social media. Actually, most people are basically decent. Mm. Um, and and I think that is, and I sort of feel that, you know. I kind of, you, you, you know, there are lots and lots and lots of very decent, you know, good-hearted people out there. And I'd say that's most of the country. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting as well to think of public figures. That's another thing that kind of gives me a bit of hope. People like Marcus Rashford, you know, other footballers who maybe aren't getting as much kind of uh, uh, headlines, but are still kind of doing a lot of great charity work, make a huge difference. Totally. I mean, look, what Marcus Rashford has done on free school meals, on all of those issues has been extraordinary. And, you know, I think he's incredibly impressive. And the England players and, you know, standing up against racism, all of that, I think is, you know, and, you know, you could, we can't do this podcast at this time without mentioning Gareth Southgate. I mean, you know, what a model of leadership and and sort of decency he, he he's showing, I think. Yeah, and, and, really, and, really, and he's really um, contextualising his efforts as an England manager along lines that would be idealistic for everyone because it's like... There is no uh, preference based on name or status amongst players. There's definitely no preference based on, you know, uh, ethnic origin or racial background. So Gareth Southgate almost, maybe unwittingly, strategically has provided a successful and efficient cosmopolitan England team. Totally. Which on holographic principle could show people like, you know, this is, us arriving to the final has been a culmination of a collaborative effort of people who are from various backgrounds but identify as English. And if we create a society whereby we are equally inclusive and we do celebrate, uh, you know, the same attributes of various parts of society, of segments of society, meritocratically, we could have an England team, so to speak, or metaphorically about the population of English people that could also, you know, elevate the status of the country. This so, is who we are, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think the other thing I'd say, by the way, about Southgate is it's quite a, it's not a chest-beating model of leadership. <laughs> no. You know, it's a sort of very empathetic model of leadership. It's trying, you know, as I understand it from reading about him and so on and listening to him, it's about understanding his players. It's about who they are, what their ex life experiences have been. You know, it is a, it is, you know, there's quite a lot of politicians could learn from it. Yeah, humanising humanizing all sides. You know, politicians normally, I, I guess, and you have more experience than me, of course, a lot of the time they have to kind of uh, orientate their narrative or their, uh, about joining a group by pitting that group against another group. So a lot of time it can be, you know, well, being a Labour MP means I have yeah. to mobilise Labour yeah. constituencies uh, to oppose Conservative views or those who vote Tory, when in reality there is always going to be some intersectionality of outlook for all people, as you said. Everyone's, for the most part, is relatively moderate and relatively decent, and only extreme instances of fear do people tend to, you know, act outside of that level of basic human decency. Well so, said, very well yeah, said. Yeah, it's, it's such a it's, it's such a weird thing. That I, I believe that football um, culturally might be, and that's why, as a effectively used as a tool. 
can be one of the greatest bases or examples set for cohesion and unity amongst, you know, British people. Definitely. Because, you know, I've heard, I've heard stories, like friends have told, people have said that, like, even kids that have left the UK to go and join a terrorist camps years ago would still call home and decide they could be tracked by Interpol or MI6s that they would call home and be like, what's the football school's a match of the day? Because they still <laughs> have an affinity with it. Like, so, yeah. you know, it's, 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 yeah, that definitely gives me hope. I'm not blind as I think, like, you know, I just couldn't identify completely jingoistically with the idea of football and stuff. But I think, you know, as uh, Gary Neville said uh, during the match, Gareth Southgate's a good leader in that, you know, he is serving as a conduit between these players and whatever angst and whatever complexes they mm. may have and, you know, between other stakeholders within the game and he's protecting these players while being accountable to these stakeholders but also taking into account their humanity, not just, you know, their athleticism and we're saying positive results. So I think, yeah, yeah. with the correct counsel, the uh, the uh, youth of the... gives me the most uh, hope for the future. Definitely. And um, what a... What a brilliant question. In fact, just discussing that for 15 minutes uh, gives me some extra hope as well, actually. Uh, so thank you, Ed, for bringing that to the show. Pleasure. Pleasure. My question is going to sp- kind of spike us towards a little bit more of political discussion that's maybe a slightly different, um, which is kind of, you know, the, the, the Labour Party you, you led uh, was off the back of Gordon Brown, uh, uh, if uh, that's correct, uh, unless I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Unless, unless I'm wrong, my yeah. And um, my question is, you know, kind of after Corbyn and now Keir Starmer, how left can the left go? Because I feel like the right has definitely gone pretty right over the last few years. Uh, so how how left can the left go? Because it feels like we're in an era where the right is saying that the left is going so left, you should be terrified of what they're doing. Um, and uh, that's potentially nonsense, as some of us know. Uh, so I'm fascinated to know what you think of how left the left can go in in the UK for now. For now. <laughs> I mean, that is such an interesting question, Howard. I, I suppose my starting point, and this isn't going to, uh, I won't end up as a politician's answer. I'll try and answer it as candidly as I can. <laughs> I think my starting point is not the label. It's the, what is the situation of the country? This is the way I've thought about the book. So we've been through the financial crisis, Brexit, and all of the division that caused. And now we've had coronavirus. And what that has shown up about our society and the way it's run, you know, how much of our people, you know, our key workers, our care workers, the most important workers in our country, arguably the least paid, the least secure, our public services underfunded whether you're able to work from home, not work from home, whether you're able to be safe at work, power, this is a power at work. You know, all of those things have been thrown into sharp relief. And so when I look at those three crises in a decade, I think to myself, the country needs big change because, and, and that's even before you get to climate, the climate crisis. And, you know, this is something that I've obviously deal with in my day job and I was the climate secretary a decade ago. We're in the decisive decade on climate. You know, it's this de- unlike any other issue, if, how we deal with climate this decade will have implications not just for like now, but for generations to come. Oh, right? Ed, we've, so we've talked about it many times on this podcast yeah. where we say, no matter what you're talking about, if there's no planet to live on, these things aren't going to matter. It, 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 exactly. So, so then you look at all of those things and you think, how can you not say we need big change? You know, You've got to have big change. You've got to answer these fundamental problems. I think it goes actually back to what Dane was saying earlier on about young people and their response to the situation they find themselves in. So, so that's sort of my starting point. And then, if you, and then there's this there's this elusive thing in politics, which is the centre ground. Politics is one in the centre ground, you know, where the middle voter is. Well, that's sort of true, but the question is, where is the centre ground? Yeah. It's like you know. Is the centre ground, you know, uh, like we have expensive higher education, we pay our key workers badly, we don't fund our public service? Well, I don't think that's where the centre ground is. I actually think, you know, the centre ground is somewhere else. The centre ground is where we do need decently funded public services. We do need our key workers to be paid. I don't think that's particularly left wing, you know. That's such a good point that, you know, referring to like um, where we orientate people from the centre or being centrist. I mean... For me, just based on what you're saying, maybe it stands to reason that maybe there are certain elements of uh, 
municipal or civil services, which could make part of the centrist base anyway. So, it, I mean, based on what you're saying, you know, most people in most most parts of the country are somewhat moderate. Surely there must be a list or a enough moderate policies or centrist policies that we could all adopt and agree upon, and then people could kind of move around there. Does that make sense? In terms yeah. Of like, yeah, like you said. So it's like everyone should have clean water, for example. Everyone should have access to electricity or, you know... Yeah, or should Amazon, you know, should Amazon and companies like pay their taxes? Yeah, yeah. Everyone, should, yeah I mean, like, everyone should agree everyone on that. Everyone's yeah. going to be thinking, well, that's, you know, that's, that, you know, definitely the tech companies should pay the, you know, proper taxes. Yeah. You know, as I say, should our key workers be paid, uh, you know, properly? At least a, a, a sustainable wage. Yeah, you know, sustainability doesn't just apply to the, the, the climate. It's like, because even I'm like, even if you are someone with conservative leanings, you understand that you have an inter- interdependent relationship with other aspects of society, whether it's business, uh, you know, free market, uh, or even, or even, you know, civil services. So surely you'd want that to perform at its most optimal level. Even if I was a Tory, surely I'd want someone who's driving me somewhere. As you know, someone who's really mentioned someone driving somewhere, someone who's building the roads which I drive on. You'd want that person to be of optimal health and you know intelligence to perform that job to the best of their abilities. So. Would you not provide a framework which supports that? Completely. Right. Now, he, that's in a way the optimistic thing. I, I just want to sort of put a note of not exactly pessimism, but just the thought about political change, which is that when new ideas are first proposed, they are often derided. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to present myself as the great, like, you know, person here, but but so when I said we should put a cap on energy prices, right? When I was Labour leader, I was like, well, the energy prices are, are like a bit of a rip-off. The people are getting, you know, the companies are getting away with it. David Cameron famously said, you're living in a Marxist universe, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and so it was like, you know, that's the nonsense idea. It's never going to work. Now it's the government policy, right? Yeah. And some of the other things I said also then became government policy. Now, so partly I, I sort of say this because, you know, there's this um, American writer who once said this thing that I remember, which is, and this is obviously her perspective as a, as a leftist. She says the good ideas start out on the left and they end up in the centre. Yeah. And in a way, and that's her perspective as a leftist. But but the point is, and some people on the right would say that about themselves. But but I think there's something in this which is good ideas start off as controversial. People, you know, first they ignore you, then they deride you. Well, and then, and then you a, got- a, a great example of that has been when we've talked before about. Andrew Yang, who was running for the president, yeah. and he talks about universal basic uh, income. Yeah, liberal wage, yeah. And, and, that and uni- universal basic income was the most crazy thing that anyone, like, oh, give everyone, well, it was like a $1,000 a month, yeah. whatever it was, and that will make the economy work. And then we've gone through a pandemic. Basically, that's happened, unless I'm mistaken. <laughs> unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, you complete. Stimulus package, or C- Colin Kaepernick kneeling yeah, as a protest of police brutality, was uh, vehemently opposed throughout yeah. uh, both nations, and now is going to become a part of the natural etiquette before football games kick off. So, you're, you're completely right about this. You're completely right about this. But let me just say to you, it is hard. This, I mean, mm. it is because because making the case for for things. I've got this quote. There's this famous political philosopher Nicola Machiavelli. Sorry to do this to you. Yeah. Uh, he wrote hundreds of years ago, he said, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more, more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies in all those who profit by the old order, and only lukewarm defenders in all those who profit by the new. Wow. And maybe Colin Kaepernick is a good example of mm-hmm. that. You know, it, it, you, it's, 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 it's hard, this, because people are, people are sort of quite resistant uh, to the change, they sort of think, um, you know. Eh, well, the, it tends to be it tends to be dismissed. One other thing, which is sorry to kind of sound like a nerd here, but well, actually, I am. Uh, <laughs> so there's this concept in political science called, and I think this is really important. It's called the Overton window. That's the window in which political debate takes place. I think what's so interesting about your Andrew Yang point is he shifted the Overton window. So suddenly an idea that looked like on the margins became kind of debated as a kind of serious idea. And so one of the things that politics does is as well as sort of changing things straight away, it shifts that Overton window about what's 
you know, acceptable what's within the bounds. And that's a really important thing. And it works both ways because obviously uh, a man like Donald Trump who says anything that comes into his head uh, does the damaging side of that. But the, the, the positive side of shifting that Overton window, which uh, hopefully listeners, you enjoyed that uh, a bit, bit, bit of information, is that uh, it, it, it can kind of... It can it can happen, but I think one of the things that I always think about, and I, I, Dane, we, we've done a hundred plus episodes of this show together, and it's like I say things a, a bit regularly, but that's because they're still not changing. Uh, is is you know what are the principles people live their lives by? You know what are the principles you live life by? And and that's not a universal thing. That's not a universal thing. You know, there's religion. Religion can offer some guidance. Some people take that very very seriously. Some people don't. Some people don't believe it at all. And, and using, you know, our lives and our brains and our, you know, relationships like me and Dane, you know, we've used our relationship to talk to great people, you know, for this show, which hopefully helps people get a kind of idea of how they want to live their life. But there's no, it's not like you're born and you get the rules. <laughs> and, that, yeah. and those rules, I think they could actually be established a little bit more, not like you have to do this, but it's like, for example, we don't want to end the planet. There's a, there's a rule yeah. that we can all... We don't want to end this planet because then about 20,000 people will get on a spaceship and that will be a plot to a movie that nobody really wants to see. Uh, it would be quite entertaining, but it would it, we, we don't you know we prefer the planet to keep going, right? But so, but do we but do we though, or do or do some of us want the planet to remain, and some of us are prepared to uh, make an omelet by breaking a few eggs in order for us to arrive at Mars and take advantage of their very ferrous, uh, you know, <laughs> iron, iron ore filled um, planet? So um, that that's a well, thing. That's, really. that's that's money, right? That's just basically money. That's that's the that's well, yeah. The, the, the I mean, but it's kind of capital, you know. it's, the, it's the true prevalent faith system. And, uh, you know, if you were not to look at industrialists as businessmen or, you know, leaders of commerce and instead look to to them as religious zealots, Mm. maybe they wouldn't have as much uh, credibility then. But that's that whole pessimism, optimism thing, which you're completely completely justified in what you've just said. It's just that, that sense of like, okay, so rule number one. Don't ruin the planet. Well, what if it's being convenient? Well, if it's being convenient, you know what? You probably actually do just need to not. I mean, what's the worst that can happen if we don't destroy the planet? <laughs> the planet? You know, people say consp- climate change is a conspiracy, Ed. I'm sure you've heard people talk about this. It's like, what's the worst that can happen if you don't ruin it? You know. <laughs> com- com- completely. Well, it goes back to this thing, doesn't it? Which is, I think that, I think, I think a number of different competing things are true here, which is, I think Dane's completely right about, the fact that there is, you know, a centre ground where you can, like, do some really important things. Um, and I th- actually, there's going to be a consensus, I think, for, for, for a lot of those things. Um, but I think the climate thing is does sit on its own because we're in a race against time. And there are big interests, big fossil fuel interests, that it's not like the individual people who run these companies are, like, quote-unquote bad people. It's just that like, the economic system that they work under, uh, I'm not saying they don't have responsibility, they do, but the economic system they work under demands that they carry on extracting the fossil fuels from the ground. This is a and, complicated and, thing, yeah. This is and the question thing. is, how can we how can we change that? But again, I think there is sort of cause for optimism. There's this movement I talk about in the book, which is the so-called divestment movement. So that's like stopping people investing in fossil fuels. And it began as a tiny thing on American in American universities and it's now like a multi-trillion dollar campaign that's mm. like got the Church of England and all kinds of other people involved so you know it's 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 hard change is hard but it is but it is winnable and I think it's winnable and I think you can you can you can shift things you can sh- the, the center ground can really can sh- it, the center ground is actually I think more progressive than a lot of people say and it can also shift yeah well that's brilliant and um Thank you for for taking on that question. That's uh, you know slightly, or it's a bit spicy potentially, given the 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 last ten years of the Labour Party, which has um, has gone has gone up and down. Um, But I'm going to hand it over to Dane now for the final question of today's show. Thank you, Howard, and uh, thank you, Ed. I um, I'm not with regards to uh, the status of the left. I'm not sure if I am as optimistic as Howard is uh, in terms of crests and troughs. I've, I have lamented watching what I believe is a much slower erosion of kind of left of centre uh, quasi socialist values in this country, um, even to people who historically would have held some kind of socialist views. 
have f- partially due to dis- uh, disillusionment and I think also partially just due to, you know, being in a privileged position where they probably have, you know, can take advantage of certain elements of commerce that they wouldn't have been able to do previously. And that can be very difficult to give up. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, from your standpoint, what would you said would have been the height of socialism in this country? Because I feel like if if we don't return to the, some state of uh, egalitarianism and uh, care for other human beings, then we could see the complete erosion of the left in this country. So are there like halcyon days of socialism that you recall? High points. That, high yeah, points, high I guess. Points that yeah. We could, yeah, a highlight reel where we could focus and maybe return to whatever uh, political structure or manifesto kind of preceded those. Because uh, I things, mean, I just things I we can celebrate on yeah. things we can celebrate on Instagram. Because yeah. <laughs> for me, it's like you know, it's it's like you know, for me, for my you know, recorded memory, one of the greatest achievements of the people of this country was after witnessing you know, unbelievable amounts of sorrow and genocide at the at hands of the Great War, made it a point of principle to say that there should be a framework within this country where if anyone needs any medical attention, they should receive it. And now we are on the cusp of potentially losing that, which I think would be one of the greatest modern day atrocities of this country, if nowhere else. So it's great. Jen, it's a great question. I was actually going to start there. I was going to start with the NHS because, look, the NHS, I mean, it is such an interesting history, this. So, you know, your listeners may not be aware of this, but up to 1948, we didn't have a comprehensive free at the point of use health service. Mm -hmm. You had to pay some, some. It was a patchwork charity, private. Uh, it was a, you know, it was a mess, and people had to pay for healthcare. You know, like we look at America now, and we think, oh, we wouldn't want that. Well, that's what something like what we had. Um, and you know, what are the roots of this? Uh, again, I mentioned in the book that, that in 1909 there was a, a report on what's called the poor law, helping poor poor people in our country, and there was a minority report. Uh, like it's a few people in the report, they're not the majority. They said, well, we should have something like a National Health Service. So that was 1909. It took till 1948. But top of my highlight reel is the NHS. Mm. And think about, you know, then fast forward to where we are today, Dave. And what is our, I genuinely say this, what is our proudest institution? When you ask the British people, they say it's a National Health Service. And think about its principles. You know, you don't have to leave your credit card at the, you know, at the door of the A&E. You know, yeah. you're treated free at the point of use, whoever you are, rich or poor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the people who work in the NHS, I mean, it is an extraordinary it's performance in the vaccine rollout uh, in, in Britain. You know, it's it's extraordinary. And I think it is, I, and I do think it is such an important principle. I think it is a sort of socialism at the heart of our country. Yeah. And I don't, I actually, look, I think, I, you know, I worry about it. I worry about the waiting lists. I worry about the waiting times. I worry about the privatization. But I don't think it's going to, I think it's fundamentally untouchable in its core principles. Mm-hmm. Because I think it is, it's so, they can do privatization by stealth, which is the waiting lists are so long, you've got to pay to get treated quickly. But, but you, you can't, it, the British people's attachment to it is so great. So that's my number one on the mm-hmm. highlight reel. I think. Uh, even though it's de- the decline in democracy and all that, the fu- the struggle for the vote, you know, mm-hmm. that didn't happen because like rich people wanted like everyone to have the vote. It's because you know people, including women, struggled and got the vote. And I think that you know that's a really important uh, part of the twentieth century universal suffrage. That is an incredibly important part of the highlight reel. The right to form a trade union, somewhat under threat and somewhat very difficult mm-hmm. now in lots of parts of the economy, such an important. Uh, part of the highlight reel at uh, the limits on the working day you know uh, it's like in the night in the 1860s i think it was the average working week was 62 hours hmm. you know now yeah. you know it's like we, we 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 just cannot believe what you know the whole notion of the weekend was a sort of is a relatively new concept um now lots of people work too hard today but you know that came um with struggle we talked about it earlier, LGBT rights. You know, that is a really important part of, the, it seems to me, part of the highlight reel. You know, from the age of consent to equal to equal marriage. The, the, the struggle against racism, which obviously is so so much unwon, needs to be won. 
Um, but, but the struggle for racial justice, I think that is part of the highlight reel, the Racial Race Relations Act, other things that came in. Now, that isn't to say it's one, but it isn't. But so I think, you know, and, and in a sense, look, I think the thing I want to say is we get to write our own highlight reel. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got to write the highlight reel of the future. And and I think it is, I don't think it's impossible. I think it, it can feel very difficult, but I don't think it's impossible. Do you think it's, do you think it's the, the, the nomenclature, the, the wording? Because I feel like in the same way that, like, feminism by its nature is socialist, it's egalitarian as an ideology. It's, you know, women should have the equal rights to pursue for any kind of pursuits they want. You know, your your gender doesn't predispose what kind of life you should have, which I completely agree with. Um, but some people have been able to subvert the term feminism and misrepresent it, and so it becomes conflated with misandry, or it becomes conflated with uh, men hate or chauvinism. And I think maybe that's a problem with socialism as well: is that most decent human beings, irrespective of how they vote, think underprivileged children should be fed if they're not able to, you know afford nutritional sustenance themselves. Um, but when you broach these conversations with socialism, people begin to, their minds begin to move towards, you know, benefit scroungers and, and, ben, and you know, benefit well, cheats. They'll that, say Marxism. It's like a dirty yeah, word. Mar- Marx, yeah, so because, how's it, how have we been able to make this word, yeah, have such negative connotations? Is it is it that we need to move away from using words like socialism, are they maybe somewhat archaic? And is there a way where we can contextualize the ideology that people can get on board with? Well, and that's where Dane, before Ed answers, is just that, that's where you look at, you know, we love talking about the US here. And you look at, <laughs> you look at the people Trump mobilized, you know, who were, who are being underserved in some respect, or well, they were not satisfied, clearly, you know, and therefore were pulled along by him. But, you know, these people would believe in socialist ideals if they were just told what they were, if, if they were told they were conservative ideals, you know, I mean, it's kind of. I think there's such confusion about what well, the bank, the, what the those bank, words the bank, mean. The banker, bail, the banker bailout is a perfect example of socialism uh, benefit. For the rich, um, yeah, for the rich, uh, benefit in private um, business. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, but but you know, it's interesting this because there's this poll that recently came out from a an organisation called the Institute of Economic Affairs this week, actually, which is a relatively think tank on the right, and it said the poll of young people from the age of sixteen and thirty four. And that 67% would like to live in a socialist economic system. And they associate socialism with terms such as equal, positive terms such as equal and, and fair. And, you know, I think I think there's something interesting about this. I'm not I'm not saying the labels are that helpful necessarily, but I think there is people respond to circumstances, I think. And and if you talk to people about not the labels or the sort of you know, wonky terms, but but the but the actual fabric of their lives and how they can be different and better, then I think people respond. I mean, just take this issue, because I care a lot about it, and it's actually, it, this goes in the highlight reel too, actually. Um, housing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I talk in the book about the, the, Vienna, the capital of Austria, and how they build lots of public housing. We haven't built public housing in this country for 40 years. And by the way, that's a you know, that's uh, a I bad that's, on both. That's, that's almost two generations. Yeah, yeah. on both parties, yeah. right? Because that just started it, and then and then and then the Labour government did some good things on housing, but it didn't build and just didn't build social housing at scale, right? I mean, I don't, and and that would definitely be part of the highlight reel, by the way, because after the nineteen forty five, Labour and Conservative governments, to be fair, built social housing, right? We're not going to solve our housing crisis. Governments of both parties have tried every which way they can to solve the housing crisis. People priced out from the private rented sector, homelessness, all that. We're not going to solve it unless we build our public housing at scale. I don't think that's socialist. I think it's just actually common sense. Yeah, well, this is, and this is, this is the thing, yeah, that's a really good point of how we present certain things in the same way that, like, if your nurses can't afford to feed themselves, they won't be able to take care of you when you get sick. Exactly. Exactly. It's, 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 do you know what? I, I, I know it's, it's a slight tangent, but it's to me, it's a branding exercise. You know, I work in television, Ed, you know, and I, sometimes I'm trying to come up with the right name for a show. I'm doing that with something at the moment. It's driving me up the wall. But, you know, the kind of, I kind of look at it and go, okay, socialism, Marxism, late, left. Like, we just need to, like, because, you know, the, the right, you know, as much as I wouldn't vote for a lot of what they do, they, they seem to package it in a way that, you know, obviously it plays on fear, and it plays on kind of anxiety, you know. So it's not it's not something I want to mimic, 
Um, but you do wonder if, the, if there could be a nice little rebranding for the left. It could be international, Ed. You could be an international icon uh, that rebrands the left. I think I might have to leave the branding to you, Howard. I don't think I'm very good at the old branding. Um, um, but, but yeah, you know, but you know, there is something interesting about the right in Britain and uh, even about Trump, which is, you know, obviously I think Trump is appalling person. Um, um, and I don't, you know, I'm not too keen on Boris Johnson either. They are having to mimic what were left causes and claim that they care about them. <laughs> so if you think about Boris Johnson, he's saying, I care about levelling up inequality in the north of england if you think about trump he said i care to care about the fact that you know people don't have decent jobs anymore yeah. it tells you something about sort of where the zeitgeist is people are asking questions about why is our society not working for us look i have a constituency in doncaster i, I represent a constituency in doncaster um where most people voted for brexit now they didn't vote for brexit i don't believe mainly because of immigration or the EU. They voted because they said, I want a new beginning. I want something better. I want an economic system that works for me. And in a way, you know, you've got to understand that and then think, well, how do we respond to that? How do we answer that? And I think I think there are answers. I think that's the... So, so I think, look, I think, Howard, you're right about the branding. And I think the, the labels can be really off-putting for people. And I think, Dane, you're, you, you know... You're you're right to have a sense of realism about you know where we are, but but I think I think it's partly about getting away from the labels actually and talking yeah. to people about their lives. There's loads of baggage. There's loads of baggage with those I, old labels. I think the the rigidity of how we label ourselves, particularly in social media, where we have a lot of this political discourse, has made people feel they not only have to rigidly identify with these labels, but it means having an affinity with one label means you have to be diametrically opposed to the other. And that's not always the case. Some, like, being that, uh, you know, it's it's a given a lot of time that, you know, being the descent of immigrants, that you would identify with a lot more socialist policies, obviously being a big part of representation of the staff of the NHS via Windrush. But by the same token, a lot of people in the uh, Windrush or Caribbean community will have some conservative views, at least along, you know, Judeo-Christian lines in terms of belief. Um so there definitely has to be a ideology that or political ideology that is that has an intersectionality for everyone there, which, as you said, I believe is what we would historically call common sense. But as I said, it, it made sense that you want your medical professionals to be able to be fully nourished and be able to be of sound body and mind to perform their jobs better. It makes more sense for you to have police officers being uh, supported and by their government so that they don't end up performing poorly because an underperforming police officer or an inefficient police officer manifests as police brutality and people responding to what they perceive to be an authoritarian state. Um, it, it serves that if we are going to bail out bankers, then as far as I'm concerned, then that is a government being actually uh, fiscally shrewd by being primary investors in an institution which will yield a dividend or return on investment. So if we're going to bail out the bankers, fine, but we are the primary shareholders. So if they're reporting profits now, then that profit as preferential shareholders should be returned to us as a dividend and reinvested into, uh, you know, municipal and civil services. Yeah. It's like a, because that's how the subprime mortgage happened in the first place. Local authorities and other aspects of government were investing in, you know, toxic assets like subprime mortgages mm. in order to have a larger um, tax base or more coffers for like civil services. Yeah. So why not take the money we've now invested into the banks that we now have profited from and reinvest that into the government. Like I, I said as a policy as well, that it would make sense if all municipal buildings, hospitals, fire stations, government buildings, town halls, etc., all had solar panels and all had a sustainable source access Definitely. to renewable energy. And then you would be able to ratify to uh, either, you know, um, and then you'd ratify the construction of said infrastructure to the working class and allow people to be involved in building their country and deriving their pride from being able to be directly involved in building their country as foremen or doing research and development into the most efficient uh, energy usage. Um, and if that works effectively, then by the same token, in a very Windrush way, that's a competency that Britain could import to the rest of the world in helping them develop a more sustainable or ecologically sustainable framework. Common sense, and, common of, sense uh, and evolution, eh? Yeah, we, we solved the problem of lack of employment. We solved the problem of energy, uh, of energy dwindling energy or energy shortage. We uh, can address, I should say, address the problem of uh, climate change. 
And this is all done while still, make, you know, still within the frameworks of a free market and providing new opportunities and not just the, and, you know, all the issues that a lot of people who are opposed to socialism. Or, or and by the way, I think you're complete, just on that last point, I think you're completely right about this climate thing, because, you know, the climate cri- tackling the climate crisis is obviously an absolutely essential thing that we've got to do to avoid disaster. But in doing so, we can create a better world. Yeah, you know, warmer homes for people, more green space, better public transport, decent jobs. You know, I think it's actually the positive vision that is so important in this. I sometimes say, you know, Martin Luther King didn't say I have a nightmare; he said I have a dream. Yeah. And and I think if you, we've got to talk about the dream, not just the nightmare. I mean, that isn't saying we don't need to be truth telling about the nightmare. We do, but we've also got to talk about the positive thing we can do. Well, it's an interesting point because what we're discussing now in terms of like issues of like an ecological nature or juxtaposing uh, ecological policy versus capitalism is uh, after Martin Luther King had a dream, his nightmare was the fact that he realised that he was trying to integrate his people into a... Uh, basically into a world of where the real issue is economic disparity and that people's... Um, drive for financial or capitalist gain really is what drives the wedge between people along these lines of racial or sexual orientation. So that's why it's always like, I don't want to integrate my people into a burning house. Because if you use the analogy of burning, for example, Ed, like the smoke, the billowing smoke that comes from a a blaze pollutes the air. And that's kind of where we are now is that our burning of like fossil fuels and our burning of resources, our burning of even human beings as a resource and depleting into those resources is by creating division amongst people and, you know, leaving people to work harder than they ever done with remuneration as a result of that not being the same. Like, you know, how mm. we've gone from those times. Like, what's crazy is that as much inequity that existed in Martin Luther King's time, even for your average white suburban family, you could probably survive off a dual, of a sole income, which they can't do now. So, you know, even those who have benefited from ideas of white supremacy and racial inequity must realise now that we are dealing with a burning building. And, uh, you know, whoever has the matches they don't really care about any of us. And so until we unite along some line of socialist or humanist policy, then well, we'll, the, the world will literally burn, as we discussed. So, yeah, it's um, it's been, I mean, not, I don't know if that's the most positive moment to leave the episode. I was going to say, we've got to get to some, we've got to get some optimism. Well, yeah, <laughs> the, the only way to, to avoid the nightmare is to wake up. Yeah. So if we all wake up and we all uh, monitor all of our welfare, then, um, yeah, we can return to a nice dream. But sometimes you need a nightmare to wake you up, oh, have yeah. a drink of water, wash your face, check the person next to you is okay, and then in a big global platonic spooning session in the <laughs> global <laughs> that is the bed of our earth, then we can have go back to the dream. Well, <laughs> you heard it here first. The global <laughs> platonic spooning that's, session. Um, that's so, the spin I'm going to put so in. So having had a very lovely, it's been a very lovely spooning session between the three of us. Ed, Ed, <laughs> Ed, Ed I, I know Dane will agree. This has been a real joy for us. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Even cooler than you sound on TV, Ed. So thank you wow. very much for coming on the podcast. Um, really love the idea of the book. And uh would love if you could tell our listeners where they could find out uh, more about your good works and uh, regarding the podcast and the book, etc. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's thanks so much. Well, look, Go Big, How to Fix Our World, which is my uh, book, is now available at all uh, good bookshops and online uh, retailers too. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope people will engage with it. Let me know what they think of it. Our podcast is uh, Reasons to be Cheerful, um, which you can get on all um, podcast uh, apps and and it's really t- t- and I think both of them are trying to say um, look we can create a better world and we shouldn't give up hope and there are lots and lots of good people who are out there trying to create a better world and and, and anyone can be part of it you know um, it doesn't it, you can't just leave it to the politicians I feel that strongly as a politician um, we can all do it so I've been really enjoyed having uh, being on and um Really grateful for the invite and, and really enjoyed this this chat. It's been our absolute pleasure. Uh, Absolutely. You've been listening to Dane Baptiste Questions Everything, hosted by Dane Baptiste. For more from Dane, go to danebaptiste.co.uk or follow him on Twitter at DaneBaptweets or Instagram at Dane Snaptiste. Our guest was Ed Miliband. You can follow Ed on Twitter 
at ed underscore Miliband or on Instagram at ed underscore Miliband. The show is produced by me, Howard Cohen. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the Howard Cohen. The show is mixed and mastered by Audio Culture. You can follow Audio Culture on Instagram at We Are Audio Culture. Please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to us. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at DBQE Podcast. Thanks to Polly, Gelly, and the ACAST team for all their support. Thanks for listening, guys, and remember, question everything. <laughs> <laughs>